Good evening, everyone. Uh, we'll just wait a minute to let everyone join. So welcome, thank you for joining us on what is a snowy evening, um, most of the country, I think. Um, tonight's event is co-hosted by Holocaust Centre North and the University of Huddersfield Centre for History, Culture and Memory. I'm joined tonight by Rebecca Gill from the University of Huddersfield and our wonderful speaker, Christine Schmidt. Just a few technical details before we get going. Um, I will be monitoring the chat box and if you have any questions that you would like to put to Christine at the end of the talk, please put them there. The talk will be around 45 minutes and then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. We are recording this event and we will send out um, the recording tomorrow along with a short survey. Any answers you can give always help us to improve these. I would just like to introduce our host, Dr. Rebecca Gill. She is a reader at the Department for Communications and Humanities and is an expert in the history of modern war, humanitarian aid and refugees. So the perfect person to host tonight. I would now like to hand over to Rebecca who is going to introduce Christine. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so tonight we're going to be joined by Dr. Christine Schmidt. Deputy Director and Head of Research at the Wiener Library in London. Christine is uh, working um, on a project at the moment on post-war search and collecting initiatives and is currently writing a social history and archival biography of survivor accounts sourced by Eva Reichmann in the 1950s. Christine has just launched the exhibition Holocaust Letters at the Wiener Library, which she has co-curated with Sandra Lipner and which is on view um, at the moment and through to June this year. In this talk, Christine will explore the work of Dr. Eva Reichmann, a German Jewish refugee woman who launched a project to co collect eyewitness accounts of survivors for the Wiener Library in the 1950s. Holocaust refugees and survivors conducted many of the interviews and the accounts demonstrate the importance of collecting for shaping early knowledge about the Holocaust, specifically the experiences of the persecuted. They also demonstrate the vital role of women whose work helped shape the field, both in terms of early scholarship as well as safeguarding evidence. Highlighting key exam examples from the collection, this talk will show how Reichmann's work challenges the idea that survivors were silent after the war. Thank you, Christine. Thank you both. I'm just going to get my screen going. Hopefully everybody can see that. Is that good? Yeah, good, good. So um, thanks, Rebecca, for that uh, lovely introduction. And of course, thanks, Chelsea, and also to uh, Hannah for inviting me and organizing this talk. Um, it's a particular pleasure to speak always for the Holocaust Center North, because I really greatly admire your work and appreciate what you do. And of course, also for the University of Huddersfield, Huddersfield Center for, Hol for History, Culture, and Memory, um, which I think is also doing really excellent work. So um, thank you very much for, for having me. Um, just to give kind of a little lay of the land of what we're going to be doing today, um, as today's talk is for International Women's Day, I'm really delighted to be speaking about a project I'm working on that focuses on the history of the Wiener Holocaust Library, which, as Rebecca said, is my home institution um, and its work after the Second World War. And as Rebecca also mentioned, this talk will focus on women who shaped the collection of evidence after the war, in particular, Dr. Eva Reichmann, who was the library's first director of research. And what I'd like to do today is tell you more about Reichmann's work for the library in collecting survivor accounts. She and the interviewers uh, she worked with ended up collecting some 1300 accounts over several years of work, both in Britain and beyond. Um, and I'll speak about the history of the collection and why the library began doing this in the 1950s. And I'll show how people like Eva Reichmann and Nellie Wolfheim, who was another important contributor to this project, decided what was to be recorded and what wasn't and why this is important. So in short, we're going to try to recapture a sense of their quote unquote shared conceptual framework. Now, these are the words of scholar Hannah Paulin Gallet, 
Um, and in other words, we're going to think about what women like Ava Reichman and Nellie Wolfheim thought was important and how did the interviews they collected reflect their assumptions, biases, values, and so on. They contributed to a collective, well-established effort to try and salvage what they perceived had been lost, and in so doing, demonstrate the ways women contributed to early documentation efforts. Now, also to add, I'm including terms um, on, the, on the slides that I use uh, during the talk in case these are unfamiliar to many, or if you want to follow up on authors I mention, um, or citations that I mention, um, or if, you know, for some reason with my pronunciation, they don't come across very clearly. So, uh, so you'll see these um, throughout on, on my slides. So to begin, everything has a history, and this includes archival institutions and collections, like the library's eyewitness accounts collection. I'm going to refer to this as EWAs sometimes, so that's the kind of short, shorthand. Um, and so first, we can situate the library's EWA collection within the history of collecting during and after the Holocaust more generally. There has been a lot of work uh, done on early documentation and research efforts, particularly with and since the groundbreaking work of Laura Yokush in her book, Collect and Record, which I've, I've shown here. She analyzed early historical commissions in France, Poland, Germany, Austria, and Italy, um, but she did not focus on uh, Britain. Uh, so those who collected documentation began to do so even while the Holocaust unfolded, including within camps and ghettos and at great risk. Some of the same individuals went on to form historical commissions and archives after the war, aiming to document who was murdered and to collect evidence for war crimes investigations and prosecution, as well as for memorial purposes. So this derived from a longer tradition of what is called Hermannforschung, or destruction research, uh, which was uh, developed by Eastern European Jews long before World War II. So I've included a few examples of uh, recent work and conferences that have focused specifically on the role of victims and survivors documenting their own destruction during and after the Holocaust. And of course, there's many more I could cite, but I've just shown uh, some examples here. And although it hasn't been treated extensively in the literature, the Wiener Library's work before, during, and after the war fits very well into this frame and into the scholarship, and my work aims to contribute to that discussion. Now, second, and perhaps more to the point of this lecture, survivor historical commissions of the post-war period were dominated at the highest ranks by men, among them historians and other academics. In the library's case, um, we have Alfred Wiener, who I'll talk about shortly. And here on the slide, you see Louis de Jong in 1950 um, in Amsterdam at the Institute for War Documentation. Women, on the other hand, were numerous, but less likely to hold high profile positions in the commissions and were not always professional historians or other academics. Ava Reichman is a bit of a, 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 an outlier, but we'll talk about that in a minute. The work the, they conducted was the lifeblood of the commissions, however, and included uh, conducting interviews, collecting material, and working as archivists and secretaries. This is the kind of unseen labor that is, isn't necessarily treated in the historiography. In general, women's contributions to the survivor historical commissions have been overlooked and underanalyzed, especially in comparison with men's contributions, although this is changing with more recent work on Rachel Auerbach, who I've also uh, shown here. Um, she was featured in uh, the Crimes Uncovered edited compilation for an exhibition we did at the library a few years ago, as well as Miriam Novich, Lucy Davidovich, Nella Rost, and Eva Reichman. So the reason for this, and here I would like to quote from another historian named Sharon Geva, um, is because their work of documenting, researching, and commemorating the Holocaust is seen to have, quote, reflected distinctly feminine attributes, and quote, their work as documenters took place behind the scenes. So they haven't been granted the same sort of authority, and so their work often remains neglected. And I think it's important to think about the history of the library's collection of eyewitness accounts and the individuals who brought the project into being, the kind of the how and the why, in order to help inform us of how we can interpret these accounts. And we can also look to the library's collection, which was organized and directed by a woman scholar, to consider women's contributions to shaping historical dialogue more generally. Now, this is not meant to be a kind of uncritical celebration of women's contributions, a kind of hagiography of sorts, but rather focus, focusing on these to understand better how women shaped the foundations of research from the start. So that's a sort of general lay of the land. 
Um, I'd like to begin today with the focus on Eva Reichman, um, here writing in the Journal of the Association of Jewish Refugees in 1954, where she launched the first major public call for the project. Now, the um, AJR Journal was, of course, one of the largest um, uh, publications for uh, refu Jewish refugees in uh, the UK, and it still is in publication today. She wrote, we all bear witness, we all have a duty to fulfill towards our past. Political developments on a global as well as on the Jewish level are not too auspicious for keeping alive the memory of German Jewry. Now, end quote. So incidentally, the title of this talk uh, comes from a draft she wrote for this paper, which she had titled, We Are All Witnesses, which is a slightly different uh, for, from this final version that was published. And in my view, the call she published in the AJR Journal in 1954 is a good indicator of the context for understanding the creation and scope of the library's project, because it situates the project to collect and the library's work within the social and cultural framework of the survivor and refugee community in Britain and beyond at the time. The accounts are very interesting for what they can reveal about, quote, unknown events or unknown aspects of known events. Um, in these are the words of the oral historian Alessandro Portelli, but the links they demonstrate to communities and networks of refugees and survivors after the war is equally important in my view. So the project was supported by the Claims Conference, and it was carried out over uh, about five years and eventually amassed some 1,300 accounts. It was conducted in cooperation with Yad Vashem in Israel, which administered the grant and also received copies of the accounts. The interviewers included many women and many were Holocaust survivors and refugees themselves who were both interviewed and who conducted interviews. The library also has a rich archival collection of correspondence that provides further information about the creation of the accounts, the administration of the claims conference grant and the correspondence between Reichman and those who conducted and gave interviews. In many ways, the project continued the important work that the library's founder, Dr. Alfred Wiener, and colleagues had been carrying out since before Hitler's rise to power. After the war, the project emerged at a crucial or critical point in the library's institutional history, and its work uh, shifted from collecting with the purpose of undermining the Nazis to collecting to preserve, commemorate, and, and importantly, to facilitate research. And here, I'd like to just take a moment to review the library's history quickly in case you aren't familiar with it. Um, today's Wiener Holocaust Library was born of, effort, of the efforts by the scholar, uh, Dr. Alfred Wiener, whom you see pictured here. I assure you, we do not smoke in the reading room anymore. You can see him um, sitting at the Manchester Square location, sitting in his office, but we don't, we don't allow that any longer. Um, he, upon returning from his military service after World War I, he saw an alarming rise in anti-Semitism in Germany and wanted to understand and do something about it. He began to work with colleagues in the Zentralverein, or the CV, um, which translates as the Central Association of German Citizens of Jewish Faith. They worked to collect and disseminate material that would serve as a warning against anti-Semitic extremism. Wiener fled Nazi persecution, first to Amsterdam, where he established the Jewish Central Information Office, or JCIO for short, and continued to collect and provide information from there. He then moved, uh, understanding the uh, potential dangers of their work, um, in 1939 to London, where he continued his work, although his family remained behind, his wife and his three daughters, whom you see uh, pictured here. They would eventually be deported to Westerbork and Bergen-Belsen, and his wife, Margareta, died just after she was released from the camp. After the war, the library turned more purposefully to gathering victim narratives of persecution, collecting a variety of different forms of testimony, including personal accounts such as these, but also letters, court depositions, and other kinds of documents donated by interviewees. And I'll just showing a few examples of these here. The project rested on methodologies that the library's predecessor, the JCIO, was using in the 1930s. For example, they did gather eyewitness accounts, some um, 350 of these in the days and weeks after Kristallnacht. And I've included the link here to where you can, these are all published um, online as a digital resource and you can have a look at these. Many of them were anonymized because the witnesses were still in danger. Um, and in 1945 and 1946, the library also published Jewish Survivors Report documents of Nazi guilt. And I've included uh, a couple um, excerpts of these here. Now, 
like many of those who conducted interviews for the project that started in the 50s, Ava Reichmann was a German Jewish refugee who came to Britain before the Second World War. She became director of research for the library in 1945. And like Wiener, she had worked for the CV before she and her husband, the jurist Hans Reichmann, left Germany for London after he'd been rounded up during Kristallnacht and released from Sachsenhausen with actually with her help. Like Wiener, she too lost family during the Holocaust. Her mother, Agnes Jungmann, was deported to Theresienstadt in September 1942 and did not survive. She was a prolific writer and thinker on anti-Semitism and antecedents to the Holocaust, and she published Hostages of Civilization in 1950, which provided a critical treatment of the debate on the alleged failure of Jewish emancipation and its relationship to the Holocaust. She became extensively involved in the German-speaking Jewish refugee community in England, and for Reichmann, the imperative to collect grew out of her scholarship and critical work in the area of communal defense. And like Wiener, she became an advocate for reconciliation after the war. And I'll talk a little bit uh, more about this in a few minutes. And we can see from her writing on the project that the aim was to memorialize a culture and society that she saw as having been effectively destroyed. This was a, a, a quote, lost past or heritage, end quote. These are the words of another historian, uh, Zoe Waxman, um, when, in talking about how um, collections can serve as, uh, as memorials. Um, but she also did it to promote future research into the origins of that destruction. In short, she was shaping early research on the Holocaust period not long after the events had ended. I just want to unpack this a bit more and think about how her concerns, her research focus, and her background help shape the project. Then we can think about how understanding this context helps us find new insights in the accounts and to read them closely as is essentially as products of their time. Reifman saw gathering eyewitness accounts as a means of filling gaps in the record of evidence that she saw being left by the purposeful destruction of documents or their potential unreliability due to censorship at the time. The accounts, in her view, would give a record of, quote, personal experiences of the time of enforced silence, end quote. Her idea is supported in this institutional correspondence I mentioned um, about the project that we have in our collections and the ways in which Reichman worked alongside interviewers to develop a specific sort of historically accurate narrative in her view. This was a rather common methodology for historians and other scholars working at the time. The idea that the more accounts you have about a single event, the more accurate the picture of the past, the past as it essentially as it really was. And this is the words of, of Ranka, who I forgot to put on the, the slide, but I can come back to that. Um, she directed a small group of paid staff members and relied on additional volunteers to conduct interviews and collect the reports. The interviewers were located throughout Europe. They traced, contacted, and persuaded potential interviewees to participate, usually by word of mouth or advertisements in newspapers. Um, they began close to London, but eventually became more systematic and, and um, spread out further. The reports were very occasionally drawn up by the authors themselves, but essentially these were heavily mediated co-creations drawn up by the interviewer and the interviewee. After one or more conversations, the report was drawn up and it was then reviewed by Reichman and her staff to quote, ensure that it contained no mistake or misunderstanding. So I'm quoting from our internal documents about um, how the project, how the project came to be. And then it was checked with the interviewee and very often signed off. It was then incorporated into the archive, cross-indexed, and cataloged by a team of mainly women staff, such as Elizabeth Zadek, who was a former German Jewish refugee located in Switzerland, and Ilse Wolf, who was a librarian based at the library in London. So here you can see a handwritten evidence of Reichmann's mediation. She was correcting both dates and grammar, and her notes are left in the final account in the collection. And so it's absorbed in, in this way. And why, why is this important? I think because it's evidence of the ways in which Reichmann intervened to help create what she and others came to see as a quote unquote accurate account. And nowadays this might be perhaps surprising because we, when we think of survivor testimonies, perhaps especially audio visual testimonies, um, there's this idea that they might, the words of the survivors cannot be challenged or there's some sort of sacro sacrosanct in a way. Um, so this might be surprising uh, to people who haven't used um, or looked at early accounts. Um, here we see Reichman making decisions based on different assumptions about the correct version of the survivor's story. And I'll talk about this more when we talk more about uh, the case of Nellie Wolfheim. So 
just to give some further nod to the theme of unseen labor, here you get a sense of the categories the team developed for cataloging uh, for the original collection. And this is, if you look at the collection on our website, which I'll talk about at the end, um, you can see this, this structure um, is still there. Um, as you can see, the main priority in terms of coverage was to encourage interviewers to examine the period 1933 to 1945. However, there are some examples that uh, stretch beyond this temporarily. While we don't have the questions that each interv interviewer asked, it seems that very few people were asked to reflect on their lives after 1945 or to think about the meaning of their experience, although this did happen occasionally on, you know, on someone's own volition. There was also no push to include a didactic message about lessons at the end, as in some more contemporary audiovisual accounts. So now I'd like to just talk a bit more about some of the other uh, German Jewish refugees, particularly women who contributed to the project. Among the interviewees included well-known contributors such as Inga Deutschkran, Anita Lasker-Walfisch, and uh, Hage Adler, who also conducted interviews himself. Dr. Nellie Wolfheim, who is pictured here, was also both interviewed and interviewer. Wolfheim was a feminist specialist in Freudian-based psychoanalytic pedagogy for young children, and she was banned from her work due to anti-Jewish laws. She managed to flee to Britain alone. She was unmarried and had no children um, at the age of 60 in 1939. She lived both in Oxford and London, never quite reestablishing herself as a pedagogue in her newly adopted country. Yet she continued to write a considerable amount, particularly focusing on aging and gender in the accounts that she collected on behalf of the library. She developed 22 reports based on at least 30 interviews for the project, mainly held in the auto shift old age home, which is based in London, where she eventually quote unquote, retired at the age of 78. She kept, she kept working um, even after this period. So in my reading of the interviews she's conducted, it's clear that her expertise and interest in the lives of the elderly shaped the way her interviews were conducted and recorded. And the content often focused on the psychological profiles and background of the interviewee. She was very concerned with women's financial independence and women's issues, and it seemed that most of the men she interviewed were included in the reports because they were married to the women she interviewed, and sometimes she, the men aren't even mentioned by name. So her interviewees were primarily German-speaking Jews who had fled Nazi Germany before or during the war. They ranged in age from 38 to 86 years old at the time of their interviews in the late 1950s. So we don't often hear, for obvious reasons, in later oral history or testimony projects from elderly survivors, so survivors who were older when they, uh, when they survived, partly because so relatively few older people survived, um, and also because of the time, uh, the time you know, difference between when those uh, later interviews were recorded. So her contributions and advocacy in that regard are really um, invaluable. So most, uh, as I mentioned, most of her interviewees were older than 55, and she tries to she tried to frame the story of emigration and experiences of older refugees as part of a larger Holocaust narrative in these reports that she developed. She was particularly interested in age, class, and gender, especially in women's experiences in relation to uh, flight from persecution and survival, as well as professional status, quote unquote, privilege, such as quote unquote, mixed marriages and the psychological torment experienced by victims and revealed in rather brief but disturbing small stories of abuse and cruelty, coupled with rare acts of kindness. So this account in particular uh, was with two sisters named Betty and Jenny Student from Gießen, and it touches on themes of age and gender and their desire to remain financially independent, as well as their emigration. The account also shows Wolfheim's perception of some German Jews' naivete in face of increasing Nazi persecution, or in her words, how guileless many Jews remain for a long time. That's uh, Wolfheim's words. The title of this account is, quote, would, would the Germans really do anything wicked, end quote. And we can maybe assume that this is a title that might have been a joint effort by Wolfheim and Reichmann, and I'll explain why uh, a bit more why I think this. The student sisters were 57 and 56 years old at the time of their emigration to England and were interviewed by Wolfheim in the auto ship home when they were 76 and 75. The two sisters had run a 
textile shop in Gießen that they sold, uh, quote unquote, voluntarily, as Wolfheim underlined in, in the uh, report in 1936, after non-Jews were forbidden from shopping there. They then visited their brother in London and not seeming, quote, fully aware of the seriousness of their situation, end quote, they returned to Gießen. Their brother tried to convince them to stay, but as Wolfheim describes, financial considerations held sway. Quote, they did not want to stay in England as they dreaded the dependence and believed they would somehow make a living in Gießen through working from home or something similar. Now, after Kristallnacht, the sisters understood the danger they were in and eventually left Gießen in January 1939. Most notable about their experience, according to Wolfheim, was their reaction to receiving support from their brother at least temporarily, which still troubled them at the time of the interview. And this is the interview several years later. So she writes, despite their wish for independence, they had to accept their brother's support. But even when they talk about it today, you can see how difficult it was for them to accept this. They earned some money through occasionally working from home. One and a half years later, the brother lost his job due to the war and he was no longer able to support his sisters. The ladies came up with the plan to rent a house, admittedly with borrowed money, and to use it as a boarding house. They discussed this with the refugee committee, but they did not like the idea as it would mean a huge amount of work for the two women. By they, they here she means the refugee committee. Without being asked, the woman in question from the committee volunteered her ongoing support. This surprised the student sisters, whose first instinct was to react defensively towards her, but they ultimately accepted her help. It's clear Reichman shared Wolfheim's views about the students' quote-unquote guileless responses, which is perhaps understandable considering her own emigration history and personal experiences. She wrote to Wolfheim, quote, what is really valuable about this report is the sisters' disbelief that something really bad could happen and the false sense of security that it gave them to lull themselves into. Reichman, however, also noted that while the snapshot of the student sisters' experiences and their reflections on this um, was valuable, it was, quote, thinner and provided, quote, less factual material than expected. Moreover, the report repeated themes Reichman felt were already addressed uh, sufficiently within the existing collection. Quote, now, however, it is precisely the psychological attitude that has been expressed very often in our country. As grateful as we are for your initiative, in the future it may be advisable to ask us, before you tackle another report, whether the subject that it will mainly deal with is of interest to our archives. I said that in the present case, we would have said that you need not go to the trouble because the subject has already been dealt with many times, end quote. So I think here you can see some, a bit of tension between Wolfheim's concerns, which she demonstrated throughout the other reports she collected and Reichman's aims for the project. And although Reichman determined that these sorts of details were quote, already known, within the collection, Wolfheim's interviews continued to address similar themes and she forged ahead with, uh, with writing these reports. So in my view, the interviews can be read on multiple layers beyond institutional priorities, but also potentially for windows onto what emigres or refugees were concerned about and discussing amongst themselves and what they valued as important markers of shared experiences to be recorded for the future. Now, here's a second um, example. The interviews Wolfheim conducted and her vast body of writing also for the AJR form a rich pool of sources for examining the challenges faced by elderly and refugee survivors after the war. These accounts reflect both the priorities of the Wiener Library and Reichman for the project and the temporal parameters of the culture of remembrance and research, what Reichman was trying to salvage and why. They also demonstrate the ways that Wolfheim interjected her own views on aging and other aspects of German Jewish experiences she felt important to document. Her own profile undoubtedly scaffolded her focus and the kinds of questions she was asking. And the accounts reveal the sort of concerns that troubled her and may have shaped the memories of elderly refugees and survivors in the 1950s, particularly women who came from a similar social and cultural background. So the interviews collected by Wolfheim underscore her view that the elderly were still valuable contributors to society through connections to their work or artistic pursuits. This is evident, for example, in this account, um, which she developed with Margareta Maison, who was her oldest interviewee and fellow resident of the Schiff home. Margareta Maison planned her and her husband's emigration from Munich after the arrest of a close friend and after Mr. Maison had been deported to Dachau uh, uh, during Kristallnacht and then released. 
The couple fled to France in 1939 to join their daughter and their son-in-law. They managed to survive moving around frequently in the southern zone and eventually made their way to Paris in 1945 and then moved to England in 1947. So this account rather unusually describes the Maison's marriage interlaced with the description of profound loss experienced by Marguerite Maison when her husband died. So quoting from, from this report, she wrote, throughout the time of their great suffering, the Maison's marriage was a particularly good one as it had been from the start. The pain was all the greater when Mr. Maison died suddenly in 1950 after an illness of just six weeks. To help her in her grief and desolation, her niece, to whom she is very close, moved in with her. She stayed with her for a year because she was worried about leaving her aunt to her own devices. On medical advice, Mrs. Maison began to paint again. She sometimes received portrait commissions and sold pictures from time to time. In this way, she was able to bring herself out of depression. Since November 1956, Mrs. Maison has been living in Otto Schiff house and continues to paint despite her great age. After observing the intimacy of their marriage, she shifts, uh, Wolfheim shifts to describing what Marguerite Maison could turn to in order to lift herself up. Wolfheim aimed to reinforce a sense that it was not only the lifelong contributions of elderly people that were valuable in retrospect, but that elderly survivors and refugees could still be active intellectually connected to their previous lives and pursuits. They did not seek to be a burden, a state that Wolfheim was acutely aware of as she commented, quote, there was a self-imposed pressure to play healthy in the auto ship home, not to make yourself noticeable through illness and to become a burden. And while she praised the staff of the auto ship home, she also, quote, raised the question of whether the residents who were still able should not do some work in the home, end quote. She decried a tendency, um, as she said, to regard old people as not being of full value. There's often a tendency not to trust the elderly, to take them as more frail or as more mentally regressed than is perhaps the case, end quote. So the accounts that she recorded um, also reveal a rather ambiguous relationship um, that some German Jews had to their new home country and ambivalent, an ambivalence perhaps held especially by the older generation. When news of the end of the war came, she feigned illness in order to recuse herself from celebration. She wrote, I could not bring myself to celebrate the defeat of Germany, much as I had longed for it with English people. I felt uncomfortable at taking part as one of them. A strange feeling for a Jew who was certainly more pleased and excited by the announcement of victory than most of the uh, most of the surprisingly passive English people around me. An eternal contradiction lies hidden within the Jewish soul. End quote. So my view of this collection of interviews and accounts Wolfheim recorded show that she was trying to ensure that a the dignity of the elderly, especially women, was recorded within the historical record. And as a former refugee and a woman, she was transforming and expressing um, her professional expertise and knowledge stemming from her own experience and training that she carried with her when she was forced to flee Germany. And there are other scholars such as uh, Simona Lessig and Sven Steinberg and Shirley Gilbert, um, among others, who've noted that uh, refugees live both uh, realities simultaneously. And the accounts she recorded can be seen as one of, many, uh, one of her many written outputs in this regard. And within the context of living at the Schiff home, she found an outlet for her interest in women's lives and legacies. And by crafting these accounts with other women in the main, she formed a fascinating corpus that gives us a glimpse into the lives of older German Jewish survivors in Britain at this time. Now, I'd like to come back to uh, Reichman and this idea of finding a quote, shared conceptual framework, which I started off with. Um, among those who contributed to the project that I mentioned at the beginning, and which I think can be sometimes somewhat recovered with this kind of close reading of the accounts and the behind the scenes work that went into creating them, as well as learning more about the people, particularly the women who were so involved in creating this collection. By learning about the individuals who shaped this project, we understand more about this network and community, and also about what they perceived they were trying to save from being lost. This quote from Ava Reichman, who was at the time writing about her boss, Alfred Wiener, but also likely about herself, um, she wrote this in 1983, I think embodies this for me. Both Wiener and Reichman traveled regularly and sometimes together to Germany in the 1950s to work towards uh, reconciliation. She admits to sharing his happy vision. She wrote, to him, these study groups and weekend conferences in Germany became a revelation. He radiated happiness when he told of them. 
and more than once I had the good fortune to share the joyful experience with him. After terrible upheavals, he was once again blessed with the renewal of youth. In such hours of elation, it was as it had been before. He swept away awkward uncertainties and spoke again of the synthesis of German and Jewish ideals in which he had believed in his youthful beginnings. Though the world which it had once reflected lay in ruins, shattered beyond resurrection, his life, the life of a German Jew, had come full circle. And in some ways, both the library and the eyewitness, the EWA project, the eyewitness accounts project, represent a kind of last ditch attempt by Wiener, Reichmann, and those who contributed to its collections to fulfill a vision of an institution rooted in the values of the Enlightenment and Weimar Germany and imbued with this spirit of German Jewry as they perceived it. This was sadly likely doomed to fail because they had few, if any, intellectual heirs or successors. Yet I think their struggle to do this can be seen as valiant since it expressed a determination to frame future public understanding of the Holocaust in ways that honored the humanity of those who escaped it or who survived it and those who were murdered. And moreover, examining the collection closely reveals the significant contributions of women in the post-war period who documented the Holocaust and shaped the gathering of evidence on which we all build our work today. We, could, we can't do, um, you know, we can't work on Holocaust education and research without these collections. So I think I'm actually quite ahead of schedule, um, which hopefully no one will begrudge me that. Um, but I wanted to just close by pointing again to this collection. It's now entered a new phase. It's been um, published online in the main. Um, those collection, those testimonies that we have permissions to publish, um, some of them have been marked as um, anonymous or um, you know, not to be published in those we won't be publishing online, um, but they can be found on testifyingtothetruth.co.uk. It's one of the library's digital resources. They have been translated into English, but you can still see the original documents um, with the handwritten um, notations um, uh, in the scans, and then you can also uh, read them um, in English in case you don't read the original language in which they were taken. So hopefully that link is helpful for everyone if they'd like to explore um, this collection further. So I think with that, I will close and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Christine. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, we've got a question already in the chat. So shall we go straight to questions? Um, can you see the questions, Christine? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Sh the first question was from Dan Stone. So, shall I just read that? Thank you for a great talk. Reichsman's approach to collecting is a far cry from today's oral history methodologies. Indeed, and in some ways, what she did was not oral history at all. Can you say why you think such enormous changes in the collection methodologies came about and when the change occurred? Oh, that's a big, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, and I, I think there are other people who are far more expertise, have much more expertise on the history of oral histories um, than I do. Um, I would point specifically to Rebecca Clifford's work and actually Dan's student, um, Madeline White, who's done a really excellent study um, examining um, the history of some of the later uh, testimony collections. But I think the Reichman's collection, this, this has much more links to um, interviewing and report gathering that took place in the immediate aftermath um, of the Second World War. So there are, were other collections that were um, gathered in similar ways. Um, I'll put a link to, there's an eerie um, collection of early um, uh, Holocaust uh, testimonies um, like the library's collection. Um, and even though it took place in the 50s, which was a little bit later than some of the early ones, there were other early collections that were gathered, for example, in, in Hungary, um, and there was this, you know, they had the shared methodology of trying to create a historically accurate record and also trying to establish the, um, you know, the credibility of the witness. And so, as you can see from that, that previous slide where Reichman is correcting the date, somebody had, I think, had written the incorrect date for um, it was either Kristallnacht or the annexation of the Sudetenland. I can't remember which, and she corrected it. She said, no, it's not that, it's this. Um, and I think that stemmed from this um, methodology, which required you know, this kind of credibility of witnesses, especially if you're writing history from below, which wasn't necessarily, I think, an accepted practice at the time. 
Um, and I think, you know, that if there's a great study um, about the era of the witness in the you know, post um, Eichmann trial, um, when, when Holocaust survivors were said to have found their voice, but in actuality, it was that more people were actually taking more um, institutions and uh, more people were taking them seriously as uh, sort of, it was more that um, taken as uh, believable and straight methodologies to kind of speak to just, you know, how Holocaust memory moved on and how it um, changed. I think my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you caught all of that. I just saw the, that it flashed, um, but if I need to repeat something, let me know. <laughs> I think we it just flashed on my screen. Yeah, we've got some elong elongated words, but ah. I think we did get the gist. Okay, so good. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got a, a following question from Owen Power. How accessible are the testimonies to the general public? Um, it is an important issue to educate people. Yeah, thanks, Owen. That is a great question. It's um so that link that I put up, this one I'll put it in here, testifying to the truth. Okay, you can actually um, read the test. Uh, there's a large portion of the text testimonies that have been published online. So they're accessible to anybody who has an internet um, connection. Um, and those collections that we don't publish online are accessible in the reading room, uh, but they can't be um, further published because of the, we try to um, obviously honor the original wishes of the person who gave them. So you can find them um, online. Uh, very easily. So we, you know, we do hope that people will use them. We hope that the resource makes it easy for people to access um, and use them for education and, and commemoration um, or, or how they see fit. So in lieu of a, a question uh, in the chat, um, could I ask a question about the reconciliation? Um, <laughs> so I wasn't aware of, of this um, work. Um, by Vina um, and Reichman. So how does their collection of testimony um, inform their ab advocacy for reconciliation and that work they were doing at the conferences? Um, mm. Who was expected to be reading the testimony? Were they bringing that testimony to bear in these meetings? It's a, that's a really good question. It's actually one of the questions that I have, this is, I'm, I'm little, I'm early in the, in the process um, and there is, another uh, scholar who's working on those specific questions about rec their work on reconciliation in the post-war period. Her name is Josefina Langer, um, and looking at their travels, because they went back to Germany and spoke to different groups, religious groups, religious communities, student groups, um, and trying to, to talk about repair, obviously, mostly in, in, in West Germany. Um, and so I think in terms of the where the testimonies come into bear, that's I think that's still I, I I don't know how to answer that question because I one of the things that I don't know is the extent to which these testimonies were used afterward. I mean they were copied at Yad Vashem. There you you can find copies of them in other collections. You can also see that some people. So for example, I mentioned Inga Deutschkran, who then was also writing her um, memoir. These are sometimes the basis of memoirs which were later written and so you can see you know the kind of trajectory of specific accounts um but i don't know the extent to which they were incorporated in research commemoration their speeches because we do have um, an extensive record of Wiener's uh speeches and, and writing speeches is something that i'd like to do is to see if they were quoting from them um, if people who were interviewed were involved in those events, um, because I also I think I might be giving the false impression that most of that all of these were from former um, that these were German Jewish uh, refugees in the main. There were many, um, but that that isn't the only um, people who were giving interviews for the project. So it would be interesting to see um, how they or incorporating them, if at all, into their talks um, and into their efforts. So it's a it's a it's a really good question you pose. I don't have a good answer for that though. Um, thank you. I've got an, another question from Hannah. Um, so Hannah, as it is International Women's Day, it is great to be having this talk. How much recognition have these women had for their work before your work began? 
Mm. I think it's changing. I think I'm building on um, and sort of contributing to the conversation that many others who, for example, have worked on Rachel Auerbach um, and uh, Miriam Novich and some of the women I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I think that's changing in the last several years. Um, there are there is more work and there is more recognition um, of the kind of you know they're they're perhaps more prominent than some of the the women um, I also mentioned like Elizabeth Zadig. I don't think many people have heard of her. Um, I, I was just reading um, in um, Ari Yoskovich's book, he mentions one of the other interviewers who worked alongside Herman Longbein um, to record uh, accounts with uh, uh, Romani survivors. Um, and she, her name, uh, which her name is actually escaping me at the moment, um, it will come to me. But she, you know, nobody knows about her her work, Emmy, Emmy uh, Moravitz was her name, and she was based in Vienna, and she was recording interviews, and she um, was an acquaintance of Herman Longbein. So I think the more, now that this collection is more digitally accessible, um, and the and the correspondence, which was something that the library um, only was able to um, properly catalog in the last five or six years, now these kind of connections between different projects can become much, much clearer. And I think the role of women in them will become much clearer as well. In references to them now, which is great. Um, that that new book by um, Ari Yaskovich was it was great to see that. Again, I can see my connection is unstable. So hopefully that that made sense. Um, I, think, I think we did get that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so a question from Nancy Lorimer. Um, were there any audio recordings of interviews uh, made by Eva Reichman? Sadly not. No, not that we have in our collection, at least. Um, these were all, some of them were done um, via telephone interviews and others were meetings. Um, and we do have the internal memos describing how people should conduct the interviews, but there's no... Um, Unfortunately, there is no past as well. And that's why each of the kind of corpus of interviews, so we have the interviews collected by Wolfheim, we have interview, interviews collected by Emma Moravitz, we have interviews collected by other um, you know, interviewers, and they all have a slightly different cast and a slightly different um, kind of character. Um, and you can, like, I, as I did with Nellie Wolfheim, you can kind of the concerns were of the um, individual interviewer, but of, of the interviews. Um, can I ask, uh, take the privilege again of asking another question? Uh, sure. So there questions in the chat. Um, and it was about um, the idea of destruction research that you mentioned mm. to begin with. Um, and I wondered if you could say a bit more about that and if that's something you feel that Reichman um, is doing with her testimony. Uh -huh. I think so. I think um, that the the person who's done, I think, the most extensive work on that is Laura Yokush, who I mentioned on the slide um, at the beginning. Um, and her book, which I actually have sitting sitting here, um, which you can't see because it's blurred, um, she makes this distinction between research and kind of collecting that was done in Western Europe versus Eastern Europe. Um, and and the work of the um, Jewish Historical Commission in Poland um, and the work of, of people working for the World Jewish Congress and in France and um, in Italy and how these kind of were differentiated. But she also makes the case that this tradition of destruction research influenced um, the other, uh, you know, beyond this ge geography. That's why her study is a, is a transnational study. Um, and I, I think what I'm finding that is that even though they had this, um, sort of German tradition of research as kind of scientific approach that it certainly did um, influence the way she cast the project um, as a kind of way to memorialize a past um, that had been um, destroyed. Um, and it wasn't only about getting the facts right, even though that comes perhaps the strongest in the private correspondence. So I think one of the other interesting aspects about this project is looking how how Reichman talked about it publicly and how she pitched it to people in order to get them to 
be involved, and then how she talked about it um, privately, um, internally with, with other people who were conducting interviews. So she has a, an extensive correspondence with uh, Jacob Balkaduri, who was working um, on recording interviews in the very similar way uh, to former uh, German Jewish leaders um, in the community. Um, and then his material was uh, donated to Yad Vashem. And she has a very long correspondence with him. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, we, I don't necessarily have those, like there isn't empirical evidence linking her to Rahel Auerbach, for example, I haven't found um, connections, but I do think that the work of people who were um, working within that tradition definitely influenced the way she framed the project. Um, it, was, it was obviously in the air. It was it was there even in the 1950s, which is very interesting to think about because the you know if you think about the the you know proliferation of this work in the immediate post-war period, it didn't you know it, the library shows that it didn't just sort of end um, and go nowhere. There were, there was a continuation to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I think there are no more questions in the chat, so we can perhaps draw this event. Uh, to an end slightly earlier this evening. Um, so tomorrow we're going to be sending out the recording and a short survey. Um, if you could help complete the survey, um, Hannah will share the link in the chat now. Um, it will be really helpful for us in putting these events together. And please remember there are excellent joint events coming up as well at Holocaust Centre North and ChaiCam. Um, so follow ChaiCam on Twitter and the Holocaust Centre itself um, through their website and social media. Um, there is actually another question that's just popped in. So before, <laughs> before we end it, it's um, a question about the record and research book, um, the author. Um, we've got the answer. You've put the answer in the chat, haven't you? So hopefully Anna can see that. Um, and then Hannah Randall has also just put the link into Twitter for uh, Chai Cam. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And th <laughs> thanks, Anna. Um, so I'd like to take a moment then to thank uh, Christine for such a fascinating talk and for taking the time out this evening to talk to, with us about her research and also thank you for audience for attending tonight perhaps we could have a, a digital round of applause <laughs> for uh, christine um thanks so much for having me it's really no, it's great been an absolute here. pleasure thank you um so thank you very much for everyone for attending and for supporting us i hope you have a lovely evening uh, good night everyone